All right. Uh, good afternoon. If everyone can please take their seats, and we'll get started very shortly. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, good afternoon. We're very pleased to be joined by the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs and Expatriates of the Hashemit Kingdom of Jordan, Ayman Safadi, and the Commissioner General of the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, Philippe Lazzarini. And they will speak to you about the high-level ministerial meeting in support of UNRWA, the Relief and Works Agency, and that just concluded. Uh, we'll start with uh, uh, the Foreign Minister, Mr. Safadi, and then with Mr. Lazzarini, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, Mr. Safadi, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, today was uh, a global vote of confidence in UNRWA. Uh, today rallied international support behind an agency whose heroic work in helping the Palestinian people through the misery that Israel continues to bring uh, uh, to Gaza. Uh, over 1,500 countries uh, attended our, uh, over 50 countries attended our meeting today. Uh, building on the uh, initiative of uh, also a uh, commitment to UNRWA uh, launched by Jordan, uh, Slovenia and uh, Kuwait that already has the support of 123 uh, countries. Today's conference organized by Sweden and Jordan is the ninth conference we put together in support of UNRWA. Its uh, timing this year obviously uh, is of tremendous importance uh, given uh, the uh, catastrophe that uh, people in Gaza are facing due to the continued Israeli aggression. Gaza is unlivable. There is no safe place in Gaza. People are not just dying from bombs. People are dying from starvation, from hunger, from the lack of uh, medication. Nobody can do the job that UNRWA is doing. It is irre irreplaceable. It is indispensable. It is needed now more than ever before. UNRWA and its staff made the ultimate sacrifice. Israel has killed 222 members of UNRWA staff. It targets them. It does not allow them to operate. And yet, had it not been for UNRWA, the polio camp campaign, the vaccination campaign that saved hundreds of thousands of Palestinian children from a future of paralysis, could not have happened without UNRWA. We reiterate our unequivocal support to UNRWA as a UN agency who must continue to fulfill its mandate in accordance with the UN resolution, must continue not only to support Palestinian children, women and men in Gaza, again living a misery unseen in recent history, but also supports Palestinian refugees in its five areas of operation. Almost 300,000 kids go to UNRWA school in Gaza. Those schools have been reduced to rubble, most of them. The rest that are still standing are shelters. And still, they are not safe. Hundreds of Palestinians were killed in schools that have turned into shelters. UNRWA is a path of hope to Palestinian children. In Gaza today, for those who have not noticed, 600,000 kids did not go to school for the second year in a role. Uh, UNRWA, no matter the uh, disinformation that's being spread about it, is a UN agency that's doing a noble job. Today, again, every speaker from countries across the globe reiterated their support for UNRWA because UNRWA is also a very efficient UN organization. It takes responsibility, it corrects mistakes, it reviews its operation, and whenever there's a wrongdoing, UNRWA takes action, as we have seen in uh, its implementation of the corona. Uh, co uh, former uh, French minister, uh, foreign minister uh, of France uh, report. What we also emphasize today and earlier in a meeting uh, brought together by the uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Luxembourg at the uh, Luxembourg Embassy in here in, in New York, which also had uh, uh, attendance by a good number of countries, 
is that it is incomprehensible that a member state of the United Nations tries to, to designate a UN agency as a terrorist state. That is just incomprehensible. That cannot happen, and we must stand against that. Because if a country is allowed to label an organization as noble as UNRWA as a terrorist state, then it is undermining the whole UN system, and the world must not allow that. And we will stand up to it, along with all our, our partners who uh, showed up in support of UNRWA today. Uh, we will continue to support UNRWA. We'll continue to do everything to uh, ensure that UNRWA stands, because UNRWA is also a beacon of hope for Palestinians. And that is why Israel has launched the political assassination campaign on UNRWA, because it wants to liquidate the cause of the Palestinian refugees, which should not be done and will not be done. And our position, again, the issue of refugees UNRWA must continue to operate according with its mandate until the issue of refugees is resolved within the context of a comprehensive solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict on the basis of the two-state solution and addresses the rights of Palestinian refugees. I'll stop at that and I'll, I'll give the floor to uh, my uh, dear friend uh, Filippo Rosarini, the General Commissioner of UNRWA. And before that, again, I, I salute the agency. Uh, the whole world must celebrate UNRWA as uh, the ultimate sacrifice, sacrificer as an agency that uh, its staff, its, its, your colleagues have put their lives on the front line to perform their humanitarian mission. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Safadi. Thank you to Jordan and to Sweden for having organized the traditional, in fact, uh, um, meeting uh, during the high-level week uh, on UNRWA with a group of uh, donors. So we just ended the meeting now. You have uh, highlighted quite a number of uh, issues. Uh, Ayman, let me just uh, start by saying when it comes to Gaza, you heard a lot, you had a lot of briefing, but now I keep saying that this is a place which definitely horrifies even the most seasoned humanitarian who have seen it all over the last 20, 30 years. Uh, it's unfortunately a place also where none of you, international journalists, uh, have been able to go. We have Eric, uh, a Palestinian staff uh, on the ground who have paid a high toll by reporting back what's going on. But uh, it's extraordinary that almost a year later, we still do not have uh, a presence of international media uh, on the ground. Now, we have today during this conference highlighted few points. The first one is, as you said, Ayman, the issue of the children. We have today one million children below the age of 18 living in the rubble, deeply traumatized. Among them, we have 600,000 children of the age of primary and secondary school. They have already missed a full year. And uh, I have to say that education is the only asset which has never, ever been taken away from the Palestinian. A lot has been taken away, but not uh, education. And here we are nearing a situation where an entire generation might be sacrificed if they are not brought back to learning. I was telling members today that as far as UNRWA is concerned, we, have, we are now calling the children to come back to some learning, but obviously learning in this environment is extraordinarily difficult, but we are trying to make sure that they lose as little as possible, or at least salvage some of them, because if we do not bring them back at a given time into a learning environment, this will only be sowing the seeds for more resentment, hate, or possible extremism in uh, the future. Now, we have also discussed a lot today about uh, some of the attack on UNRWA. As you know, they are relentless. They come from every corner. It's not just operationally, the staff, the premises, and uh, our operation per se, but they are also brought uh, at the political level, they are brought at the legislative level, they are brought uh, into the smearing social uh, media campaign, and so on. I have 
warn the participant today that we should not make a mistake. These are not just attacks against UNRWA, they are attacks against the broader United Nations system, they are attacks against the broader international community. They aim first at stripping Palestinians from the refugee statue, but secondly also they aim at weakening or putting an end to the aspiration of the Palestinian for self-determination. Number of UN agencies have already seen their staff being phased out. Number of international NGOs have seen their staff being phased out also uh, from, from uh, the occupied Palestinian territories. Now, the bills being under discussion at the Knesset, if they would be approved, if they would be uh, implemented, would be just unconscionable, unprecedented, would open an extraordinary Pandora box, as you say, man, a UN member state designating a UN agency mandated by the UN General Assembly as a terrorist orga organization would not only weaken the instrument uh, of the broader multilateral system, but it would also open an extraordinary Pandora box uh, and uh, with the risk uh, of becoming a new standard in any other uh, conflict uh, or dispute situation across the world and discussion were taken place in order to see what that would in fact uh, means and what should be our uh, what, what what needs to be undertaken to make sure that this does not happen last but not least we were talking obviously about the finance when we meet, uh, have this kind of uh, meetings the shortfall between now and the end of the year it's about between 60 and 80 million dollars. The agencies covered at least uh, till the end of October. I will need to have you follow up now with a number of uh, countries to make sure that uh, we bridge the gap between now and uh, the end of the year. I was also highlighting that the forecast for 2025 uh, is a little bit grim for the time being because we have a number of uh, donor country having indicated that they will that they enter into an austerity period austerity budget meaning that uh, some or many, some of them will have to significantly decrease their overseas uh, uh, budget uh, or humanitarian budget uh, in uh, the year to come. Um, last but not least, just operationally, because I have been asked this question now a few times about uh, Lebanon, of course, uh, how fears uh, are now, I mean, our collective fears of uh, yours, ours, uh, are now unfolding under our eyes uh, with the spiraling of the war in uh, Lebanon. As far as UNRWA is concerned, we have now open a number of shelters in our camps. There is no movement yet of population from the camps uh, uh, like we have seen from the uh, Lebanese uh, population from the south going to Beirut. Uh, but our shelters are now open. We have uh, already 1,500 people who came to our installation. And basically, we are providing sheltering not only to the Palestinian refugees, but also to the Lebanese and to the Syrian uh, refugees who basically are treated exactly the same way whenever they reach uh, an UNRWA installation. I think I will stop uh, here and um, back to you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. I'll now turn the floor over to reporters for questions. For all of you who ask, please uh, specify your names, but also specify to whom you are directing your questions. Uh, Saeed, you can go first. Thank you. Uh, uh, wait for the red light to come on, please. Sorry about that. Yes, thank you, Farhan. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Foreign Minister, and, and also to Mr. Lazarini, I have a quick question for you. There is a relentless campaign in Washington uh, my name is Saeed Eric, and I report for a Palestinian newspaper, Al Quds Daily, published in East Jerusalem. Uh, so there is a relentless campaign to basically, you know, outlaw UNRWA. Uh, 
I mean, we have heard last week uh, from Senator Kennedy from Louisiana, who is basically uh, saying that UNRWA is Hamas and, and the same thing. Uh, the U.S. has stopped funding with the biggest donor and so on. How are you dealing with the, with the government of the United States of America on this, and are you reaching out to members of Congress to undo this? And I, I think, Mr. Lazarini, you answered the question on the Lebanese refugees. You don't, uh, UNRWA does not require people to show identity card that they are Palestinian refugees. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Said. Uh, we continue to engage with the United States government and every other government uh, on the need to support UNRWA. UNRWA is a UN agency mandated by the UN General Assembly that is doing a great job addressing the biggest humanitarian catastrophe the world has seen in decades. Uh, we uh, will continue to advocate for UNRWA and we'll continue to explain the essential role uh, UNRWA plays in providing uh, uh, life-saving services to Palestinians in Gaza now and, uh, as I said, uh, uh, to Palestinians uh, uh, across its five areas of operation. So uh, we'll continue that engagement. We'll continue to push the true narrative that UNRWA deserves to be supported. UNRWA deserves to be uh, thanked uh, for the tremendous sacrifices that it continues to do uh, in its uh, uh, execution of its global mandate. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe just to add one or two points. Um, yes, they are, they are relentless effort to outlaw UNRWA, to dismantle UNRWA, to eliminate UNRWA. We heard uh, even at the beginning of the war that it became almost a war objective uh, to get uh, rid uh, of uh, UNRWA. Now, let's be clear, it has nothing to do with uh, neutrality breaches. If there is neutrality breaches, they are here to be addressed. Uh, you might remember the Colonna report uh, with uh, its uh, recommendation. We are hands-on into it. Uh, we, have, uh, we, are we have embraced uh, the recommendation. We are implementing them. The, st the, the starting point at that time was to say the agency has sy systems which are much more robust uh, than the average of any other agency operating in the region, but uh, because of uh, our footprint, uh, because of the complex political environment, uh, because of uh, the uh, emotional divide also prevailing uh, in the region, much more needs to be undertaken, and we have agreed on that. Uh, and today, we are regularly reporting back uh, uh, to the donors uh, on what the agency has uh, implemented. And I want also to be clear that whenever we have substantiated the allegation, they are taken very seriously and they are also fully being investigated. But again, the real motivation behind it uh, has nothing to do with uh, a neutrality issue per se. They have an overarching political goal behind it uh, and part of this goal the, 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 the main reason behind this uh, objective uh, is uh, to strip the Palestinian from the refugee status. There is a belief that uh, if uh, we don't talk about uh, refugee status, we can have a lasting political solution, which we all know. Um, f number one, the status has nothing to do with the services being provided by UNRWA. We are talking about two completely different uh, uh, UNGA uh, resolution, and that's uh, num n number one. And uh, even if uh, we would uh, decide that there is uh, no refugee anymore, it does not mean that we are anyway near from a lasting and fair political solution. Thanks. Uh, Deshi? Yes, this is Shudochi with China Central Television. My question is for uh, Mr. Lazzarini. Actually, two questions. You just mentioned the polio campaign. We know it's just one phase. What about phase two? Do you have any update? Has the Israeli authority as well as the, the Hamas, they agree to have the phase two? And secondly, it's, it, 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 it sounds weird to me now that Israeli government, some of the, those officials, they said there should be no UNRWA participating in the polio campaign. But some of them, they said, okay, we're going to cooperate so they can carry out. So what, what exactly is the relation now between UNRWA and Israel? Does that mean that 
UNRWA is so necessary that even Israel has to use UNRWA to, to, to finish the polio campaign. Thank you. Yeah, fa thank you. Uh, the polio campaign is a very good example of um, number one, partnership, and number two, to show that if there is a will, we can make it happen. It was a complex operation, the polio campaign. Now, each of the partners had different role to play. Um, first, we had to bring the vaccine. We need the authorization of uh, uh, Israel. We have to make sure that uh, uh, the parties, fighters, whatever within Gaza uh, accept it, be rolled out. We had UNICEF uh, procuring the vaccine. We had uh, WHO providing the cold chain. But the one who administered the, 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 the vaccine to the children below the age of 10 has primarily be UNRWA. If uh, you wouldn't have uh, such a uh, uh, network, uh, this number of trained staff uh, coming from the agency, we would never ever have reached uh, the 90%. Now for the second phase, I do believe that everyone understood the importance of the first phase. We know that polio has absolutely no border per se, so I would expect uh, that uh, we should be able also to implement as smoothly as during the first phase the second phase. But what about the relation between Ottawa and Israel? It you, you, you know, the, the, it is not one relation, it's a multi-layer relation. Uh, when, when it comes to uh, operation on the ground, we have our colleagues who are in daily contact because whatever we do, whatever movement we do, is also being coordinated and deconflicted. Uh, so I think uh, I, would, I, would, I would make a distinction between uh, the political level and the uh, operational level. Mike? This yes, Mike. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were looking elsewhere. I apologize. Um, this question directed to uh, Commissioner General Lazzarini, but Foreign Minister Safari more than welcome to jump in if you'd like. I think there's a question that's missing here. And the question is, why should Israel facilitate UNRWA's existence in Jerusalem, in Israel? You have a situation where Israel would not welcome in an Iranian embassy because we know what Iran is about. It's only attacked Israel once, but we know it seeks Israel's destruction. I know you're passionate about UNRWA's uh, mission and the aid and the social services and the education, I understand it. But ultimately UNRWA, and UNRWA officials have stated this publicly to certain audiences, that its mission is to pump up the refugee roles in the hopes that there comes a day that the Jewish majority in Israel can be erased. They've said it. That's political, there's a political element to UNRWA. They've said it publicly. So why should Israel facilitate UNRWA's existence in Jerusalem and other parts of Israel? Because Israel is not above the law. Because Israel as the occupying power has to abide by international law, which says the occupying power cannot prevent the implementation of international law and uh, for people under its occupation. Because Israel cannot deny Palestinians the right to live, the right to go to school, the right to eat, and the right to breathe, and the right to hope. Because UNRWA is mandated by the General Assembly that speaks on behalf of the whole international community. That is why UNRWA exists. UNRWA is there to help Palestinian refugees as mandated by the United Nations. Israel has no right, has no jurisdiction legally over the occupied territories except for guaranteeing the safety and will being of people under its occupation. That is international law, and that is why Israel is, by international law, committed, should be committed to allowing UNRWA in. Uh, it, it can violate international law. It has done so over and over and over again. But that wrong does not mean that Israel has a right to doing that. That is why we have international law. That's why we have the United Nations. And if every country decides to be a pariah state and start violating international law and demanding international humanitarian law, then our world will be a jungle. 
So a quick follow-up to that. So is, if Israel sees a threat that the international community has essentially imposed upon it, it has, it has no right to... Where is the threat that the international community is imposing? Is it a threat to feed children? No. Is it a threat to allow uh, 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 children to go to school? Put aside is it a threat to uh, vaccinate people against polio? Is it a threat to say that Palestinian people have rights, inalienable rights, anchored in the Charter of the United Nations? Where is the threat? I mean, it is ridiculous to assume that a United Nations agency mandated with a humanitarian work could be a threat to anybody. UNRWA is not a threat. UNRWA is an asset. UNRWA is an agency that's saving lives, that's helping people, that is keeping hope. That is what UNRWA is. And therefore, to assume that UNRWA is a threat is just beyond reason, beyond logic. I, I, I very, very, very quickly, I know colleagues want to answer questions. I'm putting aside, as I told Commis uh, Commissioner General Lazarine, not talking about the aid, social services, education, humanitarian missions, polio campaigns, none of that. Simply the refugee issue that Israel sees as a threat to its majority, that's all I'm talking about. Israel doesn't decide who's a refugee or not. The international law decides. Israel is an occupying power and therefore it has to abide by international law. UNRWA is mandated by the UN to help refugees until their issue is resolved in accordance with international law. And let me remind you, in 2002, the Arab Peace Initiative was out there and it spoke of an agreed to solution to the refugees problem uh, within the context of addressing the final status issue. How could a child be a threat to Israel? How could Palestinians who are living under Israeli occupation be a threat to Israel? And how could applying international law be a threat to Israel? We have to speak facts here. We cannot speak, we cannot listen to, to, to dissemination. We cannot listen to misrepresentation of facts. Again, UNRWA is an international agency mandated by the UN that speaks on behalf of the global community that has a very clear mandate that is stipulated in its funding uh, uh, charter. That is what UNRWA is. To say that UNRWA is a threat is, with all due respect, is, is just beyond human comprehension. Thank you. Thank you for our may, may, may I, I just want to add one point on, on this one. I think it is short-sighted and naive to believe that if you get rid of UNRWA or dismantle UNRWA, you have no refugees anymore. UNRWA's mandate is to provide these human development activities. Even if we stop providing these uh, activities, even if you shut down all the school and all the, the, the uh, primary health uh, center, you will still have uh, uh, Palestinian refugees. It is, the provision of the services and the statue are two uh, different issues. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, Javier Rutazu from FA News Service. Once the United States have frozen their uh, funds for the UNRWA, can you update us who are the main donors at this moment, at this moment, right now? Yes, uh, it is true that for the time being, and you know that this has been a decision of the Congress, uh, that the contribution of the U.S. is now frozen until March uh, 2025, which means we have an, a different top ranking of donors because the U.S. was the top uh, donor, sir. And uh, right now, uh, we have a country, uh, it's primarily the EU and the European Commission. I think all together, EU and the European Commission, we are at about 60% of the contribution of uh, the agency. We have seen over this, uh, the last year an increased contribution coming from uh, the Middle East and the Arab country, but we have also seen an increased uh, number of countries of uh, the Global South uh, contributing to the agency. And last but not least, uh, there have been an exceptional, I would say, expression of uh, solidarity coming from individual donors uh, across uh, the world. Now, this is not f completely, is not compensating the shortfall of uh, a large contribution coming from the U.S., uh, but it has uh, uh, allowed to mitigate uh, the impact uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of this loss. Uh, Abdul Hamid. Thank you so much, uh, Abdul Hamid Sayyam. 
from the Arabic daily Al Quds Al Arabi. I mean, we are related to Saeed. He's from <laughs> he's Al Quds. I am Al Quds Al Arabi. Uh, I have few questions, Mr. Minister, about the ministerial meeting of the Arab League in July. They said they should examine if the, it's possible to expel Israel from the General Assembly. Israel, I mean, the Israeli representative stood in front of the world and shredded the charter. And he accused 143 year, uh, countries of being supporting terrorism. And he said in the Security Council, this building should be destroyed. And he accused UNRWA of being a terrorist organization. And 226 UN staff had been assassinated. Is this country belong to humanity and to humankind and to the UN uh, family? That's one question, and I have a follow-up on that. Sir, what we want in the Arab world is to end as a priority the aggression in Gaza, end regional escalation, and create a path towards the achievement of a lasting peace that will save the peoples of Israel, Palestine, and the whole region. Uh, the, 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 the destruction and, 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 and the death and the suffering that is consuming all. What we want is uh, to uh, establish peace uh, on the basis of the two-state solution, the only way to establish that peace that would allow for the emergence of a sovereign, independent Palestinian state on June 4, 1967 lines with occupied as Jerusalem to live in peace and security with Israel. That is what we want. What Israel is doing is killing the prospects for peace. And in doing so, it is hurting its people and the future of its people as much in the same way, I would I'd rather say, in the same way that is uh, 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 bringing the whole region into the, into the abyss. What are we dealing with now? We're dealing now with an aggression that has seen more war crimes than any other uh, uh, war in, in, in recent history, that has killed more children than any other war in history. These are facts established by UN agencies, by specialized agencies, has killed more journalists than any other war in history, has killed more humanitarian workers than any war in history. And it is dragging the whole region into the abyss of a regional war, as we see happening in Lebanon. What our message is, this has to stop. It has to stop immediately. Because the amount of also hatred and dehumanization that this conflict is, is, is bringing is not conducive to the peace that the people of the whole region need in order to live free from, from war and conflict. This Israeli government has made Israel a pariah state. And what we're saying is those who want to support Israel, by supporting this government, you're not supporting Israel. Because supporting Israel is creating conditions in which Israel can live in peace and security, accepted and normalized with, with its neighbors. We have put that offer on the table in 2002 as Arab countries. And that table is still here. When Israeli officials go and incite and, 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 and instill in their people a fear and de of, 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 of their neighbors and, and dehumanize their neighbors, this Israeli government is not doing its own people justice. It's not doing them right. It's setting, up for, setting them up for a future of conflict and destruction. So that's why we say supporting this Israeli government is not supporting uh, a future of peace for the whole region, including that of Israel. This has to stop. Violating international law has to stop. Violating international humanitarian law has to stop. Israel has destroyed the whole community in Gaza, 2.3 million, reduced to nothing. Their houses turned into rubble, their schools into shelters. Kids do not have uh, 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 water to drink, uh, formula to drink. How is this conducive to peace, and how is this conducive to a future uh, uh, where people are going to live together? So basically, sir, what I would tell you is that the war has to end, the war has to stop, and the whole world should come together to uh, create an irreversible path to a just and lasting peace. And the party that is denying the region and all its people the right to live in peace must be held accountable, and that is why this Israeli government must be held accountable. Thank you. Mr. Minister, as a follow-up, I mean, His Majesty, in his statement in the General Assembly, expressed real fear of expelling the Palestinians from the West Bank to East 
of the east, east of uh, Jordan. And he said, that's a red line. And we'll not ever accept that. Do, can you share with us some information? Is there a plan to expel the Palestinian from some Israeli extremist? Or what is going on? How he based his fear that he expressed in the General Assembly. And one uh, small question to Mr. Lazzarini about the situation of Palestinian refugees in Syria and Lebanon, and if there is any casualties among Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. Thank you. Sir, again, His Majesty's words were, were very clear. They need not to be uh, uh, explained. Uh, Jordan will not allow uh, 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 the forced displacement of Palestinians into Jordan. Uh, 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 an alternative homeland will never happen, as His Majesty said, and we'll defend our own. Uh, we will not allow it to happen, simply. Now, we look at what's going on. Look at Gaza. Uh, Gaza is in, in unlivable. So when you create conditions that, in which people cannot live, uh, and when you go and destroy roads and destroy buildings after, after conquering them, that speaks to a design of trying to push the Palestinian people out. Egypt said, it's a red line. Jordan says it's a red line. And we look at what's happening in the West Bank now, and we see uh, uh, the big views and small checks of, of this world are trying to do everything we ca they can to explode the West Bank. And if the West Bank explodes, that's when you speak of the real danger of, of regional uh, uh, escalation. We see the attacks on the uh, holy sites, and uh, we've always warned that this will be the spark for, for regional confrontation. So what we're simply saying, again, is that we will never allow displacement to Jordan. We will never be a homeland uh, for Palestinians. Palestinians have their homeland occupied, but ultimately it has to be uh, a Palestinian state so that the region can, can, can live in peace. And uh, Jordan is, is Jordan for the Jordanians, for its people. So th this is the fact that we'll, we'll never, we will never allow to be, uh, to be altered. Thank you. Uh, we, we'll, we'll try for two more questions. No, now. just briefly on Lebanon. No, for the time being, Palestinian Palestinian refugees communities uh, are not at the center of what's evolving in Lebanon. As I said, as UNRWA, we have open shelter which are available for whoever needs it. So not just for Palestinian refugees. And right now, part of the thousand five hundred people we have, we have Syrian, Lebanese, and Palestinian refugees. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Tom Bateman of the BBC. Uh, Mr. Lazzarini, if I could ask you first about the current situation with delivery of humanitarian aid in Gaza. We know that Rafa has been closed for many months now. Um, we have seen Israeli strikes on al Mawasi, for example. And because there's been a lot of focus elsewhere, I'm just keen to get a bit of an update as to actually what's happening on the ground with delivery and the your ability to do that or otherwise. Um, I just also wanted to ask you about visas for UNRWA staff trying to get into the region um, and whether or not there's any Israeli restrictions on those, particularly around your sort of information gathering and publishing um, at work and if there is any problem with that. And I wanted to ask both of you, Mr. Foreign Secretary, just a bit more of a, a reflective question. When you look back over the last year and the attempts at reaching um, a way through this crisis and the impact of American diplomacy. Uh, I would just ask you, as we are here in New York, if you could give me some reflections about how you think the role of the United States has worked or otherwise, given the scale of the crisis. Thank you. Briefly, because you, you have regular operational briefing of people coming back uh, from Gaza, and as you know, I haven't been to Gaza since uh, January, because since January, I'm not authorized to go to Gaza anymore. But uh, basically, with uh, shutting down of uh, Rafa, um, the only crossing available in the south uh, is uh, Karem Shalom. Uh, when convoys have to go through Rafa um, because of the breakdown of uh, a civil uh, order, um, convoys have been over the last few weeks uh, and couple of months uh, subject uh, sometimes to looting. Um, we have uh, also an issue with a dual use uh, item. So whenever an item is considered as being a dual use uh, at uh, the crossing, the entire 
uh, truckload uh, will be prohibited to enter. But what is true too is that uh, uh, the number of uh, trucks entering into Gaza has significantly decreased uh, since uh, uh, the uh, closure of uh, the Rafa cro uh, crossing. Um, now, our colleagues are very concerned about, uh, you know, the combination of uh, disease outbreak, uh, significant uh, reduction of, uh, of uh, uh, humanitarian assistance uh, and the winter uh, looming and all this uh, recipe again for possible disease outbreak, but also again for extended or deepening hunger in uh, the south of uh, Gaza. Um, it's, as you know, the most, well, we describe it as one of the most dangerous places to be, but I hate to compare, it, uh, to, to compare with other places, uh, but just to say that uh, there is uh, no week, at least, uh, without uh, our colleagues being exposed uh, to, um, to incident. Now, when it comes to the visa, as you know, I haven't received any visa now uh, to uh, go to my headquarter in uh, Jerusalem since uh, June. Um, there are other staff uh, um, from across uh, the UN or international NGOs uh, who haven't received uh, their visa. For the time being, we have seen that uh, in general people are receiving a visa for a much reduced uh, time. Um, we used to have them for on a year, uh, for a period of uh, one year renewable very quickly, and now what we see is that uh, those who still receive a visa have it either for two months, uh, one month, uh, or three months. Uh, so much more limited. <coughs> but uh, 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 um, other agencies like OHHR, you know, they are not present uh, anymore, but they were phased out uh, before. Um, how will this uh, evolve in the near future? Uh, no one really knows. If there's time for one last question, uh, uh, Ibtisam. Uh, thank you. I, just one word on the humanitarian. Uh, all I can tell you is that the situation now is worse than it was a month ago. The challenge is not just in getting aid to Gaza. The challenge is in uh, allowing uh, the humanitarians to con distribute that aid. That is not happening. Deconfliction is not working. Uh, we in Jordan, as you know, we've conducted the, the third largest uh, aerial humanitarian campaign since Berlin. Uh, now our route is we're only allowed to send almost uh, uh, 40 trucks every other day. We can scale up. We can go up to 500 trucks a day. But the problem is even we're not allowed to do that. And once you get to, to the crossing, you need to make sure that the humanitarians are, are empowered to receive the aid and distribute it. And if you ask organizations at the ground, they will tell you that this is not happening. Only three days ago, two American-based organizations were prevented from continuing to work in Gaza. So uh, it is catastrophic. And, and, and I'd like just to highlight the issue of dual use because it is really significant. Tons of aid are, are lying in stores. Uh, in Rafah and other places uh, bec because they're dual use. And what's the dual use? You know that a protein bar is not allowed into Gaza because it's considered luxury. Scissors for children are not allowed because they're considered, to, uh, could be used as a weapon. Uh, uh, green sleeping bags are not allowed because they look like uh, military camouflage. Do you know that women in Gaza now are shaving their head because they don't have uh, uh, shampoo to, to wash their heads. So th that is the reality. So the question is, we can get the aid, we can scale up, uh, but the problem is it's not just allowing the aid in, which is not happening in any uh, significant impactful way, but also allowing the humanitarians to operate in Gaza with conditions of safety, and that is also has proven to be a major challenge. Okay. On the previous question, look, I would say we're almost a year into this war. And the logical conclusion that anyone would come to is that the world have failed. We have failed in implementing international law. We have failed in implementing international humanitarian law. We have failed in implementing Security Council resolutions, General Assembly resolutions, three pronouncements by the ICJ, simply because uh, Israel defied uh, all of that. And Israel has been allowed to act with impunity. We are now, look at what happened yesterday. Uh, President Biden, uh, along with the French President Macron, uh, put out a statement about a proposal for uh, a temporary ceasefire in Lebanon. 
Yeah, the Israeli Prime Minister lands in New York today, and the first statement he makes is that he's saying he will not stop and he will continue with his invasion in Lebanon. So Israel has defied, defied its allies. President Biden months ago asked for a ceasefire. The Israeli Prime Minister refused. Two or three months into the conflict, the, 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 the US administration asked for increasing the number of trucks to provide aid to the Palestinians, and this Israeli government refused, which tells us that it's not listening to anybody, even to its supporters and allies. And that brings me to the point is that Israel is doing all of that because it could, because nobody stopped it. And unless it faces consequences, it's going to continue with its aggression. It's going to continue with its illegal uh, measures on the West Bank that's undermining the only viable path for peace, which is the two-state solution. It is continuing with its war on, on, on Lebanon. And, and we're, in this week, uh, I can tell you, you know, Many, many, as you know, leaders and foreign ministers were here. And the question in everybody's mind is, then what? How are we going to get this to stop? And the conclusion that a year of, of failure to do so is that unless Israel is held, this Israeli government is held accountable, unless it faces consequences for its action, it's not listening to international law, it's not listening to the ICJ, and it's not even listening uh, to its friends, including the US. We have time for just one last question, Ibtissam, quick. Uh, thank you, my name is Ibtissam Azim, Al Arab Jadid newspaper. Uh, just quick follow up uh, regarding the measures. Do you believe then uh, that the Western countries, including the United States, should stop their weapon delivery to Israel until they also, until we have a ceasefire? And uh, to Mr. Lazzarini, in case the Israelis will go on uh, with their um, Knesset proposal and designating part of the UN as a terrorist organization. What do you think this will mean internationally, beyond Palestine and for other UN um, entities uh, around the world? C can I have another question to you uh, regarding just settlements? Do you think that, because set we hear every day not every day, every month, about settlements from many Western countries. Do you believe that there should be more done in order, in order to stop this settlement expansion? Is it enough done? Thank you. I think you write in Arabic, right? Yeah. So I, I might as well answer in Arabic and save you the translation, <laughs> if you don't mind. Uh, uh, we said that Israel to عواقب ما تقوم به من جرائم حرب من قتل من تحد للقانون الدولي من انتهاك للقانون الدولي الإنساني من استباحة لحقوق الشعب الفلسطيني عام تقريبا مر منذ شنت عدوانها على غزة وماذا فعلت استمرت في هذا العدوان قتلت أكثر من 41 ألف فلسطيني دمرت غزة حالتها خرافة ونرى الآن هذا العدوان يتوسع باتجاه لبنان وكنا حذرنا بأن إذا لم تتوقف الحرب على غزة ستنتشر في المنطقة كلها ونرى ذلك في لبنان الآن ونرى الضفة الغربية أيضا تشتعل أقول حتى ما قبل 7 أكتوبر عدد الفلسطينيين الذين قتلتهم إسرائيل في الضفة الغربية هو العدد الأكبر منذ عشر سنوات نسبة الاستيطان أو, أو مشاريع الاستيطان في الضفة الغربية حتى ما قبل 7 أكتوبر كانت الأعلى منذ سنوات وهذا العام شهد أكبر عملية مصادرة أراضي منذ 30 عام في الأرض الفلسطينية المعتلة إسرائيل لم تستمع لأصدقائها لم تستمع لقرارات مجلس الأمن لا لقرارات الجمعية العامة ولا حتى لقرارات محكمة العدد الدولي وبالتالي السبيل الوحيد الذي يجب أن يقتنع به العالم أنه إذا لم تواجه إسرائيل عواقب ما تقوم به لن تتوقف ومن هنا كانت القمة العربية الإسلامية في المملكة العربية السعودية والاجتماع الوزاري العربي في القاهرة منذ أسابيع وموقفنا الدائم أنه يجب فرض عقوبات على إسرائيل يجب وقف تزويد السلاح لها ويجب أن تواجه تبعات ما, ما تقوم به لأنها بغير ذلك ستستمر في تحدي العالم وستستمر في قتل الفلسطينيين وستستمر ستستمر بدفع المنطقة نحو الهاوية بالنسبة للاستيطان الاستيطان العالم كله يقر بأنه غير شرعي وأنه تهديد لفرص تحقيق السلام ومع ذلك مستمر إسرائيل في بناء المستوطنات وهذا أيضا تحد للقانون الدولي تحد حتى لمواقف دول أوروبية كثيرة الاتحاد الأوروبي الذي يقول بأن المستوطنات غير, غير شرعية وبالتالي نحن أمام خيرين هل نسمح لهذه الحكومة بأن تفرض أجندة الحرب والدمار على المنطقة أم يتحرك المجتمع الدولي ويحمي 
المنطقة من الـ 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 الانزلاق نحو هذه الحرب الكارثية يحمي الطفل والامرأة والرجل الفلسطيني من القتل قصفا وتجويعا وتعطيشا ويحمي القانون الدولي من, من فقدان الثقة الذي التي الذي بات يتفاقم نتيجة الاقتناع المتزايد بأن القانون الدولي يطبقه انتقائيا ومن دون معايير واحدة والآن هنالك أيضا حكم يجب أن لا نستهين بالرأي الاستشاري لمحكمة العدل الدولية محكمة العدل الدولية قالت بأن الاحتلال غير قانوني وبالتالي كل ما نتج عنه وينتج عنه هو باطل يجب أن يتوقف إذا لم يحترم العالم قرارات محكمة العدل الدولية و ربما سيكون هنالك قرارات ايضا من المحكمه الجنائيه الدوليه ايضا. اين سيقف العالم؟ هل سيحترم قرارات مؤسساته التي انشاها لتطبق القانون الدولي ولتحفظ السلم الدوليين ام سيسمح لاسرائيل بان تدمر صدقيه هذه المؤسسات وبالتالي تدمر صدقيه القانون الدولي وتدمر العمل الجماعي المتعدد الاطراف وبالتالي تفقد منظومتنا الإنسانية كل القوانين والأرضمة التي تنظم علاقات الدول ونذهب باتجاه الفوضى الحرب يجب أن تتوقف يجب أن تتوقف فورا تجويع الفلسطينيين عبر الحصار يجب أن يتوقف فورا وعلى العالم كله أن يدرك أن السماح لإسرائيل بالاستمرار في هذا العدوان خطر ليس فقط على منطقتنا هو خطر على الأمن والسلم الدوليين خطر على القانون الدولي وخطر على العمل الجماعي المتعدد الأطراف Mr. Lasrini? Yeah, very briefly, I won't be able to respond in Arabic, even if you write in Arabic, uh, sorry, and I apologize for this. Uh, um, I, I think I, I mentioned it before, you know, it's, uh, it would be unconscionable to be in a situation where a UN member state label a UN agency as a terrorist organization whose uh, UN agency is mandated by the UN General Assembly. I mean, it's... it's It's almost surrealist. Now, having said that, uh, would we be confronted to a situation like this one? It's not just an attack on UNRWA. It's an attack uh, against the instrument of uh, our common multilateral system. It would not have an impact only in uh, Israel-occupied Palestinian territories, Uh, we would definitely on enter into a complete uncharted territory, but we would also open a new Pandora box, uh, and this would become the norm anywhere else. If we are just outraged by what happened and nothing else, uh, basically it will give ideas uh, in, uh, for any countries who want to get rid of uh, Uh, an, uh, a UN agencies or an international body being sent by the international community. So I really hope we will not reach uh, such an extreme situation. Thank you. I'm sorry, but we and really have I to go now. Thanks very much. And I'd like thank to thank you. our guests again. Uh, I'm Anal Safadi and Philippe Lasmini. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon, everyone.